ended up being president of Engineers Ireland a couple of years ago. And um, so it kind of all was almost a full circle. Um, but from that, I suppose, um, I, I moved down to Cork and I did a diploma in Cork in electronic engineering and microprocessors were just starting, believe it or not, at the time, like PCs. The younger members would probably go from if you're talking about there now. But, um, but, but I thought that's the future rather than the older forms of engineering. Uh, and from that, then I got a job in County Cork, straight after that, down in Little Island. And then I kind of won the lotto because I got a job in a company called Amda, which was probably one of the, the, the biggest and, and leading edge companies in Ireland at the time. And before I knew it, I was you know, driving down Highway 1 in a Mustang convertible in California. So I thought this engineering thing is really working for me. Um, but it is a passport to anywhere, and it's a great base uh, qualification that you can build your career on. And I did go on and do an MBA um, because I, need, I felt I needed that to round out, you know, the finance, the marketing, and the other functions. But you can kind of do that kind of later in life. I I, I graduated from that in 2000, and you know I was expecting my second child at the time. Please just remind me of that. Um, but I think it's very hard to go back and do engineering. I think you know thinking about doing that, you know, when you're younger, it's probably a better time to do, to do that. So that was kind of journey. So after I, I joined Amda, I got a job as a manager there uh, when I was 27. Uh, going from engineer to manager was probably another one of those I suppose, choices. Do you stay technical? Do you, know, do you go into management? Do you start leading people? Um, I learned a huge amount uh, from that very first job uh, managing and leading people. Um, about the complexity, um, if you think engineering is difficult, uh, try managing uh, a group of uh, 10, or 10 or 15 engineers. Um, uh, and then another uh, divergence was that Amda had to close down because he was stopped by mainframes. Um, I kind of smile now when I hear cloud services because it's kind of like back to the future. But actually, it went from you know selling loads of these big machines to client server coming in, and the whole manufacturing facility actually closed down. And a bunch of us got together and we started working on more software and services and we set up what was called the Amdar Business Solution Centre at the time. But I think it was another big kind of, it was a shock to all of us, I think, how do you remember? Because not that we thought it was a job for life, but certainly uh, it, it was a big career. And then a lot of us, including you, had, had, had to kind of take the expression and kind of reinvent yourself and say, well, what are we going to do now? Um, so I had to find out about software, services, and a whole pile of other things. Um, but from there, um, the, you know, the good news is a company called Fujitsu was in the background the whole time, a Japanese multinational. Um, and, and they gave us money to kind of keep going, actually, at the time, setting up this software and the services company. And a guy called Martin Tomei, who was another big influence, um, led us through that period, which was quite difficult. And then it started to take off. Um, we rebranded as DMR Consulting, and because of that, I suppose, happening, um, Fujitsu Services and Fujitsu kind of rebranded everything, and eventually um, I became CEO of Fujitsu Services in Ireland. I think another pivotal point though was doing the MBA, because I don't think I could have got the CEO job without having that broader perspective, um, and that was another kind of it was tough to do it when you're working full time, you know, having a young family, but it, it was a game changer for me and actually it led to, to becoming the CEO a, a few years later. Um, I think it wasn't that I, I couldn't have done the CEO job, but I think it gave me a lot more confidence, you know, looking at P&Ls, balance sheets, all of that, you know, during that, you know, research. Um, I learned an awful lot about kind of why people do what they do, and an awful lot of it is not just related to work, so I think it helped me become a better manager. And then I went down, of course, uh, there was a merger with Fujitsu Siemens, so there was three MDs and going into one MD, so I had to go for that job look. Um, and then I was asked would I go to the UK to run the UK and business, and I was pretty much terrified actually because our business was just under 100 million, but that was a billion, maybe two billion actually. And again, I, I suppose I, I, it was another big decision because my family, we live up in Gerta Park, and I tend to walk from here. And they're in Whitehall, Colin Kills, and Ellen actually mm -hmm. <laughs> used to coach my daughter in Kamoki. It's a very small world here. 
and my son, who was about eight at the time, said, well, you can call mom, but we're not going anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so they stayed in Whitehall and I used to go to the airport and not commute. And boy, was I happy I lived in Whitehall, because it's only 10 minutes from the airport. Um, I, the other reason, I suppose, that I suppose that's important, and one of the reasons why Liam said when I come and speak, is I've lived uh, for 32 years on the north side of Dublin. And I've kind of been from Swords, Whitehall, that whole area. And we're very embedded, actually, uh, as you can see, my son with the dream of even moving. Um, in, in, and I think it's really, really important that uh, people come together to try and make the best of, of this, this part of Dublin, because I think it's a fantastic place to live. I think we're blessed with a lot of green spaces. I think we're blessed with a brilliant college uh, in DCU, we've got DIT as well. There's so many positives, actually. And for people to come together and make the most of that, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Later. For sure, but I think now is the natural way to talk about the North Dublin Development Plan and Europe, yeah. because you clearly have a vision, and you've taken organisations from being good to great from global experience. So what would you like to see happening with the North Dublin Development Plan? Yeah, well, I, I think plans are fine, and I think sometimes, and it's the same in organisations, you know, I think it's good to have a comprehensive plan. Um, but in, in, a, in a capital constrained world, sometimes you have to do things differently. I think we have to see what, you know, are there quick wins, what can we actually get done? Because I know that, you know, we, some things you can control in, in, your, in your business and some things you can't control. I think everyone has, has those challenges. And, and there are things, even in, in a big corporation, that are controllable and things that aren't. So when you have a plan, you have to kind of almost dissect the things that you can do, you can do something about, and then the ones that you're dependent on other people. And lobby like hell for those things. Mm. Like, I have to do that with, with group. We have a group structure in Vodafone. I don't get able to do everything that I want to do. And sometimes you won't. So the real thing is, how can you dissect your plan to make progress and have that sense of moving forward, even if you know barriers are, are kind of in the way? You also talked um, to me when we met before about it's not the strongest of the species who survive, nor the most intelligent, but those who are most adaptable. And that was Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Came up with that one, but, but I think it's important to talk about that change and adaptability. Yeah, because it's a funny one. And I love the quotation because it's says, the fittest that survive. I'd say he doesn't like the fact that. But if you think about it, um, in 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 business and in life, actually, the hardest thing to cope with is change. And um, right now, I mean, I'm in the middle of an organisation change. Because I came in in April, we created a new operating model, and we're right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And there's a real level of discomfort. Is all I could describe it as. You know, you know, when I'm there, shut down. That was a massive change for people. You know, when, you know, when different things happen in your life. So, I think trying to build in change resilience into people, if you like, and, and have them realise that unfortunately things don't stay the, stay the same. The pace of change now. And it's just phenomenal. Um, and if you think about, I mean, I mentioned it to you, we, like what we're experiencing now is a new industrial revolution. It's, you know, it's a, it's a complete wave of change that's happening. Everything that can be digitalized is being digitalized. Everything. So the real challenge for all of us in business is, and, and for the, the community as well, is, you know, what should we digitalize? How can we do that? How can we um, get value out of that, and societal value as well as commercial value? And they're and they're difficult questions actually. But I think we all have to be ready for that for, for that pace of change. And I, I think in, you know, to take education and, and, and preparing graduates for for life, if you like. And, and I know the graduate attributes is a big thing in DCU. You know, one of the big things is is to be ready to change. So. You start off and you do say science or engineering or whatever. You, you might get a job that's not totally unrelated to that. You know, I've kind of gone from having a lot of people reporting me to no people reporting me to loads of people. You know, but sometimes people think careers and business is straight line and it's really zigzag. And if you can keep, I think you probably have to keep. It's a bit like you've got your plan in, in for, for North Dublin. I think you have to keep that vision, that that place that you're trying to get to, and, and not waver from that. But you might have to take quite a circuitous route to, to get to that place. Um, and I, I think when you when you're leading people, I think you have to also understand that everybody deals with change in a different way. And learning that again, 
in the can we announced our change and uh, last Monday week. And the reactions of people are never quite what you expect. And to be able to lead people through that and come out the other side and, and get us to get to where you need to get to. So I, I think there's a lot in that change resilience. There is. And your leadership style, you talk about the awareness and the importance, I thought it's very important. Um, message to give here to, here to our audience in terms of how people experience you and when you went from being one of the people to being the boss and mm -hmm. making that transition of the confidence because you have great mm -hmm. insights there. When you're, when you're with people, think about how do people experience you. And then the second question was how do people experience themselves in your presence? So if you're with people, are you energizing them? You know, do they feel better about themselves? Do they feel they can take on the world? Or do they feel they can't wait to get out of the room? <laughs> you know, are they thinking about the next, you know? So I remember when, you know, when I uh, became CEO first, and it was a bit, a bit of a shock. You know, we can't name the name, but probably knows this person, but there was somebody that I'd worked with for years since the Amdown days. And I came in that morning, and I was very nervous. And I, you know, I didn't know what the people were going to think. I was walking in, went walk past reception, that went really well, I said hello, but I was really thinking about what was going to happen that day, and somebody walked past me in the corridor that had been with, you know, working with me a long time, and I kind of vaguely thought of that, but I walked past him, I never said hello or good morning or whatever, and I said, oh, you really look big for your boots, haven't you? That's good. You see, oh no, you think you're something else, don't you? Now, at least you said it to me, you know, he got up that morning, the same person wearing Friday, this was the Monday, but people have expect a different experience or something, they expect something from you and um, that's different but they also want you not to be too big for your not to, to not to change so it's actually quite <laughs> tricky and, and I realise as well that I know the expression to you, the shadow that you cast when you're in a leadership position can have an impact on people that you just wouldn't expect, you just don't expect it and to have that kind of awareness it's tough it's tough to do to have, you know, they call it self awareness, I think, but it's, it's also awareness of how other people are experiencing you. So it's even broader than what you're doing. You, you've all known great leaders, I'm sure. You've all walked with people that, and it's, I think that's one of the facets of those people that they're very tuned in to the environment that they're in, the people, and how people are reacting, and therefore they can adjust. Whereas some people, like them as well, they just kind of crash through the room and there'd be bodies lying in their wake, as it were. You know, but I, I, I think the people, the other question that we were asked, which is a tough one, is why would anyone follow you? <laughs> Not much point in being a leader if you look around, <laughs> nobody's behind you, you know what I mean? So why, why do people follow people? Um, and then how sustainable is that? So you can, you can meet these people that are hugely impressive and you know, glitzy present day. You know, so people might follow them because of that, but then if there's no depth in that, there's no substance, then actually it's worse because of disillusionment, the trough of disillusionment is deeper. And can you identify a mentor talking about, you know, um, great people or, or how we, we affect ourselves? You know, when we talked to the UK first, um, there was a guy that um, was at great help, because I was trying to figure out how do you do business over in the UK, it's a bit different. And mm -hmm. um, here, everyone does actually know everyone else. And it's it's less formal to do business here. You know, when I went there first, I, I kind of realized early on, and he pointed out that, not that you want to be someone different, but you need to realize that you need to kind of alter. Mm -hmm. And then as I got the Europe, when I got the European job, I realized that doing business in Spain is really different to doing business in Finland, for example. When we're going out to Spain, uh, let's talk about where business is headed globally and what you see happening with the technology and really driving into the future. Hmm. Way the What's happening? There's, there is, my dad was on at the moment, so I think tune into that and think you're But um, I mean, I think the, the whole area, I mean, I'm in it now, and one of the reasons I, I was, was interested in joining the telecommunication sector is I think um, connectivity is at, the, is at the core of a lot of it. Um, <coughs> everything being connected, everything being digitalized and therefore connected. Um, the artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, you know, there's so much happening 
And I think it clearly, you know, I was talking to us, one of our small business customers I was down at the bench in Limerick yesterday, and the girl said to me, I can't do the Limerick accent now justice, but he said, my head's melted from all of this. <laughs> melted, <laughs> melted. <laughs> and I, you know, from all the incoming, not, you know, messaging. From, but actually, I we've got loads of technical things. I can list off 25 technical things that we sell. But so what? So what difference is that going to actually make in the environment of the business that we're selling into? You know, and a small example, um, we sell, you know, into, say, a small coffee shop. The most important thing for a small coffee shop, apart from having really good coffee, is be able to take payment. If their broadband goes down, they can't take payments. So we said, well, why don't we give them a mobile broadband tower as a sort of an insurance policy? Because sometimes, I'm not going to name any names, we are not the broadband provider. I just said that in the nicest possible way. Um, but that doesn't matter, they're our customers. So whether we're the broad, that's incidental, actually, to their need. Their need is to be able to take payments. So they don't really care whether it's super duper or gigabit, this, that, or the other. They need is somebody shows up, they want them to sell them a cup of coffee. And if the person can do that, they'll go to the coffee shop next door. I'm just using that as a very, kind of just a real example. So the thing is to think about not what we have in, in technology, the broader sense, but what use is it?